Hello, it's Colin here, and uh, here's an exercise in critical thinking. Now, some people believe the world is flat. Yes, believe not, some people actually believe the world is flat. And here's a good argument for it. So we know this first case is true, so we say that's true, isn't it, in a container? It looked like that. Now, if we curve the bottom of the container, that would be true. No disagreement there. And if we put a container with a curve in the bottom, that would not happen. So we know that's not true. So how can this be true? Good argument so far. So maybe the world isn't flat. The world is flat. Let's see how this goes. Now, I was down the beach at Malakuta the other day and I saw this thing out on the horizon. But I wonder what that is. It looks like a city out there. So I had a closer look and I decided, well, that's probably a container ship going by. So I did a search on that using uh, the Marine app and I found out there was a ship going past at that time and it was the JPO Vela and there's a picture of that ship and that equates to that picture there. So I now what that know what that ship was. So I zoomed in on that picture and I then got to this stage. So here I am on the beach here at Malakuta and the ship is out about there. So looking at the scale down here, five kilometres, so you put the ruler in there, and we want to work out how long this line here is from this point to this point. Now, so that scale there is approximately, this is there, about 20 kilometres. So I worked out how far the ship was off the beach in that photo that I just took. So what else do I know? So looking at the information on the ship, we work out that the ship is 265 metres long. Okay, so we've got that so far. Now, here's a picture of the ship. We don't know how high the ship is, but if you look on this picture of the ship here, we've got um, a stack of two containers here. So distance, okay, let's do some maths now. So the first thing we need to do is work out how the distance affects how far the water drops as you get further away from where you're standing. So what I'll do now is I'll draw the earth and here we'll draw a line through the middle. And we'll Take a look, stack road is a bit, pretend we're further away. And then we'll look at this top bit here. So we'll take a, a right angle off the top and see what we're dealing with here. So here we have our diagram and we've got some things that we know. We know the radius of the Earth, we know the distance away the ship is, and here we've got the ship sitting in the water and we need to know how far under the horizon that we see the ship is. So we need to know that distance in there. Okay, we'll call that H. And we can see how far the ship is above the water. Now, this looks very much like a Pythagoras problem because there's a right angle there. And so we know Pythagoras's says that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, where in this triangle, this would be a, this would be b, and this would be c. So that's the c line, that's the b line, and that's the a line. Now, to work out this height here, it's going to be the difference between a and c. So the height we want to find out is simply equal to C minus A. So now we have to work out, we know what A is, we now have to work out what C is. So what is A? So A is the radius of the Earth, and the radius of the Earth is 6,371 kilometres. And what is B, which is the distance away from the shore? So that's A. 
and B equals the distance from the ship, which is 20 kilometres. And so now it's a simple matter to find C. So we just need our calculator. And in our calculator, we're now going to do 6371 squared. Let's clear that and get it right. 6371 squared, quite a big number, plus 20 squared, 400, equals. Then we want to find the square root of that, and here we have the answer. So C is equal to 6371.031 kilometres. Now we know that A is 6371, so the answer is Point oh three one kilometers, which is equal to thirty one meters. If you know your metric. So now we know that in twenty kilometers, the ocean drops about thirty one meters. So just roughly speaking, so for every one kilometer, the ocean goes down by about one point five. Meters. Does that make sense? So we've now worked out the curvature of the Earth. One and a half metres per kilometre. Now we need to see if that gels with our observations. You're all okay with that? Okay. Okay, now for the next part, we need to work out um, where I was standing on the beach. So back on the beach here, we've got the Earth, which is slightly curved, and we've got the ship out on the ocean. And I'm standing up here on the, actually on the beach, up on the beach, I'm up on a table, and I'm standing up here, taking a photo. So I just estimate my height up here, is probably about six meters. That's my guess for my height. So the earth is curved and the ship is down here. So out here at 20 kilometers, the earth has fallen away about 30 meters. I'm already six meters up. So the line of sight, which is in here, is going to be down about 24 meters. So let's see how that works out with the ship. So we're going to find a picture of the ship now. Okay, so here we have a couple of pictures now. So here we've got the photo that I took on the beach that day, and here's a picture of the ship. So if we have a look at the ship here, we zoom in on the ship, um, we can see that there's a fair bit of swell, and on that day the swell was about two metres. So the distance between the trough and the top of the waves could be as much as four metres. So we can lose four metres just in the swell, in the depth, which we can take away from the curve of the earth if we want to. And you'll see there that um, we can almost see three containers to the, the top of the container stack in some areas. So when we go back to the picture of the ship, over here, and we look at this, we've got the potential for this, let's zoom out here a bit, and let's draw a line for where we think the water level is, so it might be here at three containers. So we'll draw a line in there, and this is what we need to work with. Now, if we need to get a measurement of line there, um, a container is about 2.6 metres high, these standard containers. So that line of five containers there would be 2.6 metres times five. So if we look at from there to there, 
Take that measure there to there. From this point to this point, we're looking there at about 13 meters. So if we then take our ruler back, measure that, it's one and a quarter units. Take it back here. You can see that that distance there is approximately 16 meters. And distance down here is approximately 13 meters. So there we've got the height of the water level and we actually know the draft of the ship is about 10 meters below the water. But that's not important for this calculation at the moment. And we also know the length of the ship, which is from here to here, is 265 meters. So that puts the whole thing to scale. So the question now is, do these numbers all make sense? And they do. We've got a wave height here, can account for four meters. So we're looking at, we expect the ship to be about 20 meters. But little, and over here we've worked out 13 meters. And within our error rates, that's close enough. So I think we've definitely proved that the Earth is curved and that this picture here makes sense. And so the chances of the Earth being flat, flat Earth is pretty low. So that's an exercise in critical thinking. So we've looked at the evidence, we've examined the evidence, uh, we've used, we've applied logic to the evidence and we've come up with a conclusion. And the conclusion is that the Earth is not flat and that we're living on a spherical Earth. Now, we may have, we've basically disproven the flat Earth theory, but of course, we have not necessarily proven the cur curved Earth theory because there may be another explanation for what's happening here. But I can't think of one, so we'll say it's pretty solid at the moment. Going back to the flat Earth theory, I just thought to give you a bit of background on that. When I first engaged in this discussion, um, I was, it was explained to me that the Earth is flat, and this was the model that was explained to me. And here we have uh, the North Pole as the centre, and the continents arranged around the North Pole, and we have the equator, and then the Southern Hemisphere is outside of that. And then we have Antarctica, and Antarctica is actually just a gigantic wall of ice, which I dare say stops the oceans draining out, and that's what's at the edge of this flat Earth. And then we have the Sun, which spins around the North Pole, and they've calculated the Sun is actually uh, 27 miles across, and that's the Sun's orbit, and that is the Moon's orbit. And within that, we have all the planets, they've got their other separate orbits up there. Now, the first thing I explained to me was that the proof that uh, this is correct is that planets are in the sky all the time. And I said, well, that's not true. The planets sometimes go behind the Sun. He said, no, if you check where the planets are and you look at any planet model that they've given you, I was told that the planets are always in the sky. You can't always see them because the sun's in the sky sometimes. depends on whereabouts that the sun is in its orbit. But um, the planets are always there. So I took that challenge on and had a bit of a look at that. So I looked out the mathematics on this model and I looked at Mercury and the sun and Earth and when the Mercury goes behind the Sun, you don't see it. But you'll notice there that there's a lot of times when Mercury is not going to be behind the Sun. So most of the time, Mercury is going to be in the sky. When I actually worked it out, the Mercury's orbit is 88 days. Our orbit's 365 days. Every 88 days, Mercury goes behind the Sun, but only stays there for about five hours. So it's there much, much less than 1% of the time, and it's like a quarter of a percent of the time. So, yes, according to, if he's looking up at the sun, looking at the planets, they are in the sky almost all the time. So that wasn't going to be satisfactory. Just a little bit of background. Um, it's always worth checking out what other people say, and part of critical thinking is you need to look at both sides of the argument. If you only look at one side of the argument, um, 
how do you know that you're right? So it's always worth checking out the other side. So Googling around, the Flat Earth Society are quite organised and they have got quite a comprehensive website with lots of arguments for their theory. Um, they've got a wiki with, again, a lot more detail in things that they're claiming. And so on, on this page, they make a claim that uh, the curvature of the, of the Earth is giving 1,800 feet of curvature in 52 miles. So I did mine with metric, but so they're looking at 1,800 feet, which you divide by three to get metres. So that's about 600 metres. So 52 miles away, giving 600 metres. Uh, and my calculation, if I go back to mine, which was here, um, I said for every one kilometre, it's about one and a half metres. So kilometres a mile is more than a kilometre. So let's say it's two metres per mile. So we're looking at 100 metres. So what they're saying is 600 metres. So they're out by a factor of six. So clearly they haven't done their homework too well on, on that one. So it's pretty easy to look at the arguments, look at the facts, uh, use critical thinking. The first step is you look at the facts, you then apply logic to the facts once you've verified the facts, and then you come up with an explanation for what is most likely the truth. So I hope that's been a useful exercise. Um, I find that when you explore conspiracy theories, some of them are right or appear to be right, and some of them are definitely wrong. So as always, be sceptical, be a sceptic. Don't trust what you hear. Very few people bother to check it out. Critical thinking is no longer taught in schools, um, and that's what we teach. We'll teach you to think critically and to be able to work out, to the best of the ability, what is most likely to be true but certainly be able to work out when you're being lied to, which you'll be surprised is a lot of the time. Thank you. Maybe you wouldn't be surprised. Um, just as an add-on, um, when you're looking around the internet, you'll get lots of different sites. And here's a classic. This one's by Cook, the uh, guy that put together the 97% of scientists agree. Now, this guy is a warmest alarmist person, uh, very dishonest. The uh, site can be easily looked at and the errors and critical thinking can be found. So it's a good site to reference if you wanted to check out false arguments. It does it very well. Looks and very convincing a lot of the arguments in here, but I assure you that 97% uh, of the arguments in here are absolute rubbish. If you want to contrast it with this site, what's up with that? It's one of the most popular, most viewed, sceptical websites about climate change on the internet, and the information here is pretty solid. But again, don't take my word for it. The whole point of being a critical thinker is to make up your own mind by looking at both sides of the argument. So that's what you need to do. Don't trust me. Don't trust anyone. Check it out for yourself develop your own critical thinking skills to work out what's happening. And that's what everybody needs. Thank you.